There was a receptionist that said to the physician, the patient is in the middle of a magazine article and will see you soon, doctor. You know, sometimes we wish that would happen, right? And, uh, and then there was another doctor that uh, he, before he would do any surgery, he made sure that uh, part of his pre-surgery checks was a pre-surgery credit scan. Make sure you get paid. Amen? Oh, me. Huh? <laughs> well, we want to look today at what Paul tells us in 2 Timothy when he wrote to Timothy telling him some very serious things about the life of a believer and particularly things to pay attention to that people need. You know, we constantly need to be reminded of what God is going to do for us. And uh, we do well to remember that in God's guidance, uh, we find in the Word of God that a Rabbi Shammai in the third century uh, said that Moses gave us 365 prohibitions and 248 positive commands in the law. Now David in Psalm 15 reduced them to 11. Isaiah 33, 14 to 15 made them 6. Micah 6, 8 binds those down to 3. And Habakkuk 2.4 reduces all of them to one statement. The just shall live by faith. Now there becomes a clear distinctive in the word of God if we live by faith. Paul deals with that in our passage. He looks at two groups of people. One group are the godly. There's a distinctive for them. The other group, well, he calls them evil. We might think of them as ungodly. But they have distinctives about them. When we look at scripture, we can realize men are broken down into two categories, the saved and the unsaved. The unsaved need to know the Lord. They need to experience that uh, the blessing that comes from knowing him and the assurance and the sense of stability in life and knowing the direction that we have. Well, let's notice this distinctive in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12. He says there to us, Yea, and all that will live godly. I want us to stop there for a second. In words, all believers... The word godly means we're dedicated, we're obedient. And folks, ultimately, we're winners. We should say, hey, I have a goal. And if we're going to live godly, it's very clear. It says we will live godly in Christ Jesus. See, there's an individual that we pattern our life after. And that person is Jesus Christ. We ask, Lord, that you guide us and help us. That we live for Him, in Him. He lives in us. It makes a difference. 
See, if he's living in us, guess what happens to self? He dies. We need to remember that in the day that we live in, if we die to self and we walk into a room and everybody's wearing a mask, someone might take offense to that. Now, the thing is, someone might, uh, it works, might think that, hey, I don't want one. But we shouldn't be divided. The big things, folks, that help us out is we maintain some distance. Each one makes sure that their health is as good as they think it can be. And they're not on a downturn. If they're on a downturn, what should we do? Stay home. Till we make sure we're well. We don't want somebody else to get whatever we have. It may be nothing. It may be something that's gone in a day and, and we're on our way. And that's great. We have to realize the Lord has made us in a way that we can trust our Lord to care for us. And if we're in him, we'll be trusting him. And we'll also think of others. Not so much, well, my opinion counts. Well, we all have an opinion, right? You've got to realize other people have other opinions. And uh, we just need to pray that we be on the winning side with our Lord. Some things in time will clarify themselves. And folks, as the clarity comes, it'll work. So let's praise him. Let's realize we need to live in who? Christ. Now, I made mention a bit earlier about George Washington's 110 items on civility. You say, man, well, civility. Boy, that sounds like something belonging in the government. It does. It should. It would add oil to the machinery. Another way to state it, it's manners. Think more of others than of ourselves. God will take care of us. You know, the amazing thing is the man that wrote that, George Washington, as I recall, he spent 40 years plus of his life in commitment to serve the colonies and the United States of America. First, as a, an officer in the military, colonial days, and then in the revolution as, it's, as the leader of the army. He was a tremendous individual. Now I don't know if some folks would stop and think. He wasn't an armchair general. He would be out in the thick of it. And you can read of occasions where he was directing the troops to get them in the right direction. When he walked onto that battlefield onto that particular day, the troops were going that way. The enemy was there. He got out there and got them turned around. Folks, he, he was amazing. And as our first president, and if problems came up, he dealt with them. Begin to look, it wasn't all easy. Matter of fact, he had a little issue. They did a tax on whiskey. Folks didn't like that. He did some things that go, man, that's pretty harsh. You know, it worked. So let's realize who do we need in us? We need the Lord in us. And Jesus Christ, folks, is the one we're to make more of. You look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4 later. Boy, it's a key. It's, it's beautiful. And uh, a good thing. So we need to live godly. We need to live in Christ. 
And we notice next in our verse, it says there, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You know, sometimes I need a reminder. And the reminder is this. We're not above our master. How was Jesus treated in this world? See, right here, Paul says, hey, if you live godly, guess what's going to happen? Persecution. Well, let's not whimper. Let's not try to pamper ourselves. Let's live as the Lord would have us to live. And look to him for the grace and the strength we need for the moment. And Jesus told us, he says, hey, if they had put me to death, they'll put you to death. And then through the centuries, uh, it, it's been pretty consistent. If you live God, for the Lord, you might suffer persecution. Don't be surprised. Now, folks, that has some immense implications. Sometimes in this world, we don't do great financially. Does that mean we've done something wrong and we're not spiritual? Well, there are folks that had it together three months ago, and now they're not sure where it's at. We need to look to the Lord and realize, hey, things don't always have to be sweet and good and great for us to know that God blesses us, loves us, and cares for us. We need to stop and realize sometimes things not so good happen. But he is good and he's going to take care of us. Amen? The thing I'd like to remind you of is he's coming back. When he comes back, we're going to hear that shout. And when we hear the shout, we're going to be out of here. Then after a short period of time, get ready to get on that white steed. Huh? We're coming back. And it's going to be the king of kings coming. The lion, not the lamb. He promises to take care of us. And folks, it's not based upon the fact that we feel good today because no one's breathing down our back. We ought to realize, hey, some things happen in this life that are negative. That doesn't determine our spiritual well-being. So let's notice in our verse that, uh, hey, persecutions do come. Paul said, they that live godly will suffer what? persecutions you go into parts of Africa the Middle East believers suffer persecution there were more persecutions in the last century than there were in the first 19 and this one is looking to be a blockbuster over the last one So, let's measure our spirituality on our relationship to our Lord, not to our economic, physical relationship. Well, while we're to live, we won't live above our master. There's a distinctive, we can be a winner. Amen? In Jesus Christ, we're a winner. The road map may be different, but let's move on ahead. Let's notice next, there's a distinctive with the whiners. Now folks, the only reason I use the term whiner is because it worked with winner. But let's look at the whiner. And you figure it out from there. In verse 13, Paul says, But evil men... And seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now he says here they're evil. 
I want you to think about something. We have two, two categories here. A winner and the whiners. Think about making scrambled eggs. If you have five good eggs, you're scrambling them up. You reach over and you say, hey, I got one here. It doesn't look too good. Pop it open and you put it in with the five good ones. Now you've got one bad one. Is that the way you make scrambled eggs? Folks, the thing to remember here is to live godly, you can't be evil. Amen? There are two distinctives. They're apart. So let's notice some of the details here because uh, we're to live godly, but they're those that are rotten. Paul, first of all, calls them evil. Now, interestingly enough, the word here used for evil is a very powerful word to convey something about being evil. In the word of God, it uses the term evil in relation to, say, a tornado. An evil happening. It's something of the weather. It takes place. It's not good. But it's somewhat on neutral ground in that it's bigger than we are. We can't control it. If we could, we'd sure keep them up in the air instead of getting down on the ground. Amen? Well, the word here, evil, is different. It speaks of a person who has on their insides a malignant nature that loves to see others just writhe in pain. It's a malignancy. It comes over from the Greek, it comes over into our language as the word pernicious. It's probably the best way to convey it, right? And... Uh, we see here that he says these people are pernicious. They're evil. And he goes on and he says and they're seducers. And uh, the idea of the word seducer there is uh, they're imposters. In other words, they pretend that they're one thing when in fact they are something completely different. We meet them all the time. Let's remember, we need to live how? Godly. And uh, he says they're going to be seducers. They're going to try to draw people into their trap. He goes on and he states they're going to wax worse and worse. In other words, they don't improve. There's no self-improvement here. And we look around our nation and I think, folks, we really need to pray for our nation because things have waxed worse in that we have a deep-seated, unjust group. They're evil. They'll lie at a heartbeat. They'll deceive. They'll do things that we would think would never happen. See, we don't need to go on a witch hunt. How many of you remember the Salem witch trials? Now, the same thing went on in Europe. The only thing is it involved better than 100,000 people. It got to a pretty extensive scale. And it wasn't that their folks were witches. It's probably they were getting older and getting a little bit of dementia and getting kind of cranky to live with. But in the United States, uh, what we can be thankful for is a pastor stood up after we'd had 23 such cases. And said, this isn't right. You know, folks, right needs to rule. Justice needs to prevail. 
The kind of justice that says right is right and wrong is wrong. And I think that it says here, these folks that are evil are going to wax worse and worse. And it goes on and adds in there, deceiving and being deceived. And sometimes what we miss is, they are trying to draw others in with their deception. To believe their lie. And at the same time, they're deceiving themselves. They live in a false world. It's one to their making. And it's too real. You say, well, pastor, how does one guard themselves from this? Well, you get around folks that know God's word and you listen. And you listen to some others that know God's word. This isn't a one man show. And what you find is, there'll be agreement. Now there's some things out there in the area of theology that folks debate about. But when it comes down to it, there's a lot of the Word of God nobody debates about. It's what it says. Remember what is told in the book of Proverbs? There's safety in a multitude of what? Counselors. When our president formed the task force on COVID-19, what did he do? He brought together a group of what? Counselors. No one person is going to tilt the scale. You're going to get eventually a total picture should lay out. There's a bit of safety. See, there's hope. But notice here, there's a distinctive. You either be a winner, or you be a what? A whiner. These folks are negative. They can't work. It's got to be my way. No, there's a way that'll work. Sometimes the simple things, if we just back off, take a deep breath, and realize, hey, it's time to reset. We've given it a try. Folks ought to say in this time and day, hey, we made it past the curve. We stopped the flooding of the hospitals. Now it's time for a new program. Why? Folks, if people don't get back to work, They're not going to get better. They're going to get bitter. And they're going to die. Because they say, this is too much, I can't handle it. And for some, they were only hanging on by a thread to begin with. They need to say, it's time for another one. Time for something to take a deep breath, reset and move on. And in those that have done that, I think we'll find they will move on. Folks, it's not just our states. we got a whole world now we can look at and say, hey, this group handled this this way. These folks had this problem, and it was definitely severe and different. I think of Italy. Then you can look at Sweden. They never did shut down. Oh, their numbers went up a little. Do you know, folks, they've leveled out. They didn't kill their economy. See, we need to stop and say, hey, we're not going to let the whiners get to us. Let's watch out for them. So there, there's uh, some distinctives right here that Paul lays out for us. But I notice there's some directives he gives us. The positive side of things, if you will. In verse 14... He tells Timothy now, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. 
See, there's these directives. First of all, he says, you remember what you learned. There's many a person that has looked back to a grandmother or a mother or an aunt or an uncle or a grandfather for, that gave them direction that put them on the right path. In Timothy's case, it was his grandmother and his mother. Put him on the right path. He says, remember where you learned. And we notice as well here that uh, not only the learning, but he gives us an assurance. He says, hold that form. Don't abandon it. You know, the world in which we live could be a whole lot better off. Socially and financially and physically if they would heed what God says in his word. Folks, it starts with salvation. But it continues on into our way of life. God gives us the best, healthiest way of life we could have. And we ought to be thankful that he does that. You know, we can be assured. We need to hold it fast. Don't let go. We notice in Psalm 119.99, it says, I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. Folks, the thing that people need is right here. They need this. His word. We begin to think on it and it will make a difference. If we can't memorize what it says, you know the way to work it? Is to work it. In other words, do it. There's a story told of a missionary that was in Korea. And he had a visit from a, a convert that lived a few hundred miles from where he was ministering. And he'd walked four days to reach the mission station. And the pilgrim recited proudly without a single mistake the whole of the Sermon on the Mount. Now the missionary was delighted, but he felt that he ought to warn the man that memorizing was not enough. That it was necessary to practice the words as well to memorize them. He said, the Bible is not just a book about people who've changed. It's a book that changes those who read it and live out what they read. Well, you know, that convert just perked up. He says, you know what? I couldn't memorize it until I started to practice it. And then I could memorize it. Sometimes we approach it wrong. We work hard at memorizing. All we have to do is practice it. And we need that word, as it says here, for us. And we've been assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And they will, in verse 15, and from that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. Through faith which is in Christ Jesus. You know in Acts 14.22 it says. Confirming the souls of the disciples. And exhorting them to continue in the faith. And that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Being steadfast. Hey there's a bump we hit in the road. Well, I think somebody on this recent months, uh, they just didn't put a bump in the road for us. They took out the road and we hit it. Well, folks, God will take care of us. We need to trust him. And the person we need to trust is Jesus Christ. He's key. We trust him. So let's stop and let's remember there's a distinctive between the godly and the evil, the pernicious. Let's be godly. 
Let's live for our Lord. Let's recognize we want to be a winner and not a whiner. And then remember the directive. Focus on the word of God. Find our point to touch is Jesus Christ. He makes a difference. He'll help us. The story is told of a time when Satan held a strategy meeting and he wanted to know how they could subvert those that were close to salvation. He said, what shall we do? Well, a daring demon stood and shouted, I have it. I know what we can do. We can tell men that there's no life after death and they die and they're like animals. Satan's face fell as the, he answered. And as he said, it'll never work. Men are not ignorant. Even atheists admit of times when they sense a tomorrow after death. Another demon spoke. Here's the solution. Let's say there's no God or if there ever was, he's dead, he's gone. He's abandoned the universe. He's left it. Satan replied, that won't work either. Most of them know there is a God even though they don't seek him. Other ideas were presented but none brought hope to Satan or to his underlings. Finally, as they were about to give up, one demon leaped up and said, I have a plan. Let's go tell them that God is real. And the Bible is God's word. And a gasp came from the audience. And they were horror stricken at the thought. And some of them even went bananas. You can imagine. Bouncing off the walls. Until with a smile this demon added... Then tell them that there is not the, it's not the best time to choose Christ. Help them make excuses for delaying the decision. Tell them there's no hurry. The demons danced in delight realizing a workable plan had been discovered. My friend, if there's something for us to halt on and stop, it's this. Today is the day. Now is the time. It's the time to determinedly live godly. It's the time to determine to trust Jesus Christ. Folks, we trust him. He'll take care of us. He'll help us. Let's bow for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your truths today. We pray, Lord, you would settle hearts. Encourage lives. Save the ones that have not trusted you. May they recognize that it's only through Christ that we can have a hopeful life instead of one that disintegrates and dissolves before our very eyes. But in Jesus Christ, it'll build and grow and be firm. And we can trust you. May we live for you more today than we did yesterday, more tomorrow than we will of today. Bless now, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's take our